It's going to be killer. There's going to be a lot of people yeah. at that place all summer long. Yeah. Good afternoon. Welcome uh, to Grand Rounds today. Please remember to sign the attendance uh, records and also please, if you could, give us ideas that you might have in regards to future uh, topics and future speakers when you fill out the program evaluation. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Jamie Weidert. Uh, Dr. Weidert is uh, board certified in pathology and has been extensively published actually in pathology. Um, also a member of the CME committee. Um, did his training at the, uh, at the University of Iowa. And uh, he is uh, here uh, today to update us with uh, some pathology pearls. And so please join me in welcoming Dr. Jamie Weidert. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Um, so this is uh, in this uh, kind of this theme of having different departments present some things that they do that not everybody might not be aware of or might not know they do or maybe needs an update. So this is the pathology pearls of this series. Uh, I think uh, several weeks ago, uh, Shane Hopkins gave a similar talk and um, I think uh, Peter Buck gave a talk on common arthroscopic and uh, joint um, maladies a, a while back. So this is kind of that same uh, same theme, so I hope you like this, and this is a little bit of an experiment. This is a multimedia extravaganza today, so we're going to have some some video clips. I'm actually going to have a little live demonstration of something here, so we'll keep our fingers crossed and see if hopefully, hopefully it works out. Um, this first slide really has no bearing on what I'm going to talk about today. I just find these old uh, ads really interesting. Um, it's always it's fun if you want to Google. If you get bored during this talk, you can kind of just Google uh, web Im you know, images and look for old ads that feature physicians peddling different things. And this was from 1948, Camel ad. Um, uh, very, very uh, interesting to me how uh, doctors in our profession used to peddle things that cause cancer and heart disease, and things have changed a lot since then. Uh, interestingly enough, though, there are some things that don't change. Uh, you know, a good history and physical exam is the cornerstone of good clinical care when you see a patient in the office, and actually turning out a, a good uh, hematoxyl and eosin stained glass slide is still a cornerstone of a pathologic diagnosis, just like it was uh, in 1948. Uh, I will promise you that I won't bludgeon you, pardon use of the term, medical examiner, I won't bludgeon you with lots of microscopic photos, photomicrographs. I think I have maybe four of them in my talk. They're all towards the end, and only two of them are semi-educational. So there won't be too much microscopic stuff. Uh, we're not going to talk about medical examiner stuff, so sorry if you came here for medical examiner stuff, if you know Quincy or body approved, things like that. I will say though, if this Dana Delaney gal was a medical examiner in Story County, I would be doing all my own posts, like constantly. I mean, she was helping me out. Um, I mean, this is actually very close to our, what our team looks like. This guy over here is clearly me. Um, this is Schlick. Uh, this guy's Johnson, right there. So um, today we're going to try to hit three main topics. The, the big one, the first one I get through is basically if you have a patient and you're sending something from that patient to pathology, and if your patient asks, well, what happens? Instead of just saying, well, it goes to the lab and it comes back later, uh, you'll kind of get a, a flavor for what we actually do. So you can maybe explain it a little more to your patient or if your patient has specific questions. Alternatively, most of us in this room will at some point in our lives have a biopsy done, either uh, skin biopsy, prostate biopsy, endometrial, you know, copal biopsy, breast biopsy. So uh, this may be just important in your own lives too to know what happens to your tissue if you undergo the, the uh, needle or the knife. And then we'll talk a little bit about fine needle aspiration. It's a service that we offer as pathologists here that maybe not everybody knows about. And then I'll finish up just real briefly an update on uh, how we uh, help identify Lynch syndrome patients in our community uh, by doing some studies right here in Ames on uh, tissue. This is Valentine's Day in two days, uh, so if you haven't uh, got your sweetheart a Valentine, do so now. It's probably too late to, to provide a, a heart-shaped placenta, but uh, you can probably go buy a card that's heart-shaped or something like that. So this is a pretty common situation. Um, you have a patient referred for a mammogram and there's abnormality and she had to come back for a biopsy and the biopsy was done and you got the patient coming in the next day or maybe a day later and you look up the patient's pathology and there's nothing there. Like, oh my God, where's it at? What's taking so long? What's happening? Um, but maybe more importantly is this scenario, um, put yourself in the patient's shoes. Uh, you go in and someone said, well, you have an abnormal thing on your, 
on your breast mammogram. And then, uh, boy, they told me uh, I have to have a biopsy. And I had a biopsy, and that biopsy went to the lab. And I don't know what that means, and I don't know when I'm going to get my result back. Why is it taking so long? I'm nervous. I'm anxious. So uh, patients always have a lot of questions of us. And my general feeling is that some of us don't maybe have the best knowledge of what happens to that sample rather than just saying it goes to lab. Uh, I'm trying to arm you today with a little more uh, verbiage and vocabulary so you can explain to the patient what exactly happens and also so you can see exactly how uh, kind of complicated uh, anatomic pathology is as far as uh, generating a, a single glass slide. So this is kind of my black box talk. You know, you do a, you do a tissue biopsy, goes to pathology, and then the other end, there's a report on the computer or a piece of paper at some point, and we're going to explore what's inside that black box for you all today. First, introduce you to uh, our team here at the clinic, and, and uh, we provide the hospital here with the pathology services. So this is, this is our team. Uh, we have five histotechs. I would have showed their pictures, but they're real finicky about pictures. They don't like their faces being shown anywhere. Uh, but they're all up in this, like, fifth row down. They're all up there. So you just look over there, see them. Um, so we have five histotechnologists that uh, work hard for us every day. And I'm going to show you what they do. We have a cytotechnologist, uh, Robin Schwartz. She's, she's kind of similar to um, a nurse practitioner or a PA in a, in a regular physician's office lab. She does some autonomous work. Uh, for us. And there's the three pathologists. And then we have Joan, um, who basically kind of does everything else. So if you ever have a question, you can call Joan. Um, she may or may not be able to answer that question immediately, but she'll always get back to you and, and she'll let us know. Then there's the three pathologists. Uh, if you have problems, make sure you call Schlick because um, she's, uh, she's the best at uh, taking complaints. So <clears throat> please direct complaints to her. The bottom line, though, is we have a team of people who are dedicated to producing um, anatomic pathology reports, in, in essence. So if you have a question, call our lab. You can call Joan. Um, there's always one of us on call. So if you have a question about how to submit something, call us sooner rather than later. That's, that's kind of my message there. That's a, a key pearl, uh, because we can usually help you out when you have a question like that. So instead of just going through a textual diagram of what we do, we're going to go through this in pictures. So. This is a typical situation. I'll pick up on the example of a patient who had a breast biopsy. When we get tissue into the lab, it comes in a little jar, and there should be a patient label on that jar. It should have name and another identifier. And it also should be labeled with what is in that jar. That's basically the standard of care. Now, we don't always get all that information. We'll talk a little more about that later. But things come in a jar. And, and here, I've taken out uh, some of these breast cores that came in the jar, these yellow pieces of tissue or little core biopsies that uh, are procured by the radiologist when they do an image-guided uh, biopsy. So the tissue arrives in the lab the day of the procedure. So maybe the procedure is 8.30. We, a couple hours later, the runner will bring down the tissue, and we get in the lab, let's say, at 10.30 in, in the day. Our technologists will look at the tissue cup, and they'll uh, make sure everything matches as far as the requisition name and the patient name in the container and the date of service. And what they'll do, they'll assign a specific unique pathology number to that tissue so we can identify it in the lab, and it's linked up to the patient name and identifiers. And that's called an accession number. So if you hear us say accession number, we're referring to that specific number that gets assigned to the tissue. And our technologists will then write that accession number on these things. These are called cassettes. We'll also call them blocks. I, I use that term interchangeably. But they're little cassettes. They're small. They're just a couple centimeters by a couple centimeters, and they can fit little pieces of tissue like this in them. So the case will get a session, assign a unique, unique number, and the pathologist will come and do a, a gross exam, document how much of the tissue we got, maybe provide a measurement, give a description of color, size. And what we do, we call this blocking up the tissue, where we put this tissue into these cassettes or blocks. And uh, you can see here I've taken out of those little purple uh, biopsy holders and put them in these cassettes. And that's done in the early afternoon. And these will go, then go into formalin fixative. And formalin, um, basically what I tell patients is it's, it's like pickle juice. It's like pickling something. Okay? So it's preserving it for long-term storage. So we pickle the tissue in the afternoon into the evening. And then at night, um, our technologists go through and they uh, compare all the tissue we've got that day to their log sheets of what they've gotten in. And they'll rack all those little cassettes or blocks of tissue 
into a machine called a tissue processor. And this is our tissue processor. Luann, how old is our tissue processor? Our tissue processor is old, is at least as old as David. I think it's, I think it's probably between 30 and 40 years old. Um, again, uh, sometimes uh, technology is great, but I tell you what, these old tissue processors do the best job for us. So we're hanging on to these things like, uh, you know, dear life, because they do a good job. Uh, we load these tissue processors in the afternoon. So remember, the patient came in in the morning at 30. Her tissue is going to get loaded with other people's tissue by about 4 o'clock in the afternoon on this processor. And what happens is this a magical dance of fluids going in and out through the tissue overnight. And the way I think about it is it's basically dehydrating the tissue. We're taking all the water out of the tissue so we can look at it further the next day because water is bad in tissue. It will, it will uh, degenerate over time. And this is just a peek inside that chamber. Here's all those cassettes lined up in this little uh, wire basket. And this process will happen over about a six to eight hour uh, time period overnight while we're all sleeping. Next morning, Luann comes in at 5.30, and she uh, puts her coffee there, which she shouldn't be doing. Um, <laughs> and she'll start opening up these little tissue cassettes. And what she'll look at is these, the tissue that we've cut in the day before. So this is the, the next day after the patient had a procedure. Next morning, she's opening up these cassettes, and there's these little crispy pieces of tissue. They're very, very crispy, OK? So we've dehydrated them. They're formula fixed. Now they're dehydrated. And what she's going to have to do with all these tissues is she's going to have to take these little tweezers and take the tissue out of the cassette and then embed it in paraffin wax. So there's a little paraffin wax dispenser, this little circular thing here. And then right next to it, you might not be able to see it where you're sitting, there's a little clear plastic mold. She's going to fill that with hot wax. Then she's going to take this tissue and embed it in that hot wax. Here's a little closer view of her opening the cassette, finding a little nub of tissue in there. You can imagine how tedious this is. These, these, these samples can be very, very tiny, down to less than a millimeter. And they're doing a couple hundred of these in a the morning. And she takes that tissue out, and she puts it in this little mold. And there's paraffin wax in here. And she'll use her tweezers to position that tissue just perfectly so it's at an angle that we like to see when they'll cut sections uh, for microscopy uh, in the, the next few slides that you'll see here. So I'll do it. we made a little video of uh, Luann doing this. So I'm going to play this video. What you're going to see is her taking the tissue out, embedding it in hot paraffin wax, cooling it down on the uh, cold plate, which is this little dark blue thing right here, and letting it solidify. So here's, here goes this video, our first experiment here. Oh, of course, I didn't do it right. There we go. So she takes the tissue out. She's going to get a little plastic mold to put the hot paraffin wax in. There's the wax. Takes the tissue out of the cassette and starts embedding it in that hot paraffin wax while it's still, still liquid. And this stuff starts to cool down pretty fast, actually, so they have to be pretty quick to embed that tissue from your patient very carefully. She's going to put it on a cold plate, and that will freeze that wax pretty quickly. And she moves the tissue around so it's well-spaced and on edge. So we see the microanatomy that we want to see. How she knows to do that is beyond me, because it's, it's amazing what they can do. Put more hot wax on top of it, and she'll set it aside. And this is a big cold plate here. So now we've basically made a little block of wax embedded tissue that will sit on the back side of that cassette. So we still have the cassettes, and they're all nicely labeled. So we keep specimen and patient identifier integrity all through the process. But now instead of the tissue being inside that little that little um, enclosure is on the back side, stuck as a wax pellet. The next thing they do will be the cutting. And they'll take all those little wax embedded blocks that they've made in the morning, and they'll start cutting them. And they load them up onto this machine up upper right-hand corner. It's called a microtome. Again, there's a coffee. We don't want that there. This is Dave. Dave is no longer uh, with us. He was one of our great histotechs that uh, had tons of experience. He was very, very good at what he did uh, in our lab. The lower left-hand corner, you'll see this microtome up closer. Here's that little wax block. The dark stuff is the tissue within it. Here's that cassette that still has the patient identifier, that session number. And what will happen is they will have this microtome move up and down and come closer to this very sharp blade, that little four to five micron increments, very, very thin, less than paper thin. And they'll make what's called a ribbon. And they'll pull this ribbon of tissue off as they're cutting. 
and that will be the stuff that will go onto the glass slides. These photos here show what that ribbon looks like. This is actually the paraffin wax that's cut very thin and has those little thin pieces of tissue embedded within it, and it's laid in a pan of water. And they lay it in this water pan so it kind of gets the wrinkles out so it's nice and smooth and nothing's obscuring um, any of the tissue. And then they'll take a labeled slide and they'll gently pick up the paraffin ribbon with the tissue. You can see these little uh, white spots here. That's the tissue. It looks like skin here. And they'll pick that up onto a glass slide. So I have a couple more videos to show you how this works. And this is Rachel in our lab doing this. So the first video will show her cutting and making the ribbon. The second video will show how she puts the ribbon into the water bath and picks, picks up uh, onto a glass slide. You can kind of hear it sounds like ski shushing when during the Olympics. That's how it should sound. If it doesn't sound like you're shushing down the mountain, that means there's something wrong with the microtome. She's making this nice ribbon. She's pulling that off. And again, this thing is about five microns thick. It's very, very, very thin. And she puts that into that water bath. And that'll get all the wrinkles out. See that little white spots? Those are all the tissue um, slivers that are in that ribbon. We can stop that. And now I'll show you how she'll pick up that tissue into the right here in the water bath. She'll separate out and pick up the tissue and the ribbon onto a glass slide. Just like that. All right, so now we're about a day later. This is all done before about 8 a.m., uh, 7.30 a.m. in the morning. So your patient came in 8.30 the day before. It's taken us all the way 24 hours just to get some unstained tissue onto a slide. So lots of steps, lots of people involved. And we still haven't gotten anything that I can read out yet. So the next thing we'll do, these, these things will dry in a rack for a while. And again, the text will check to make sure every, every slide that's labeled with a session number matches what they have in their log sheet. You can see here in this close-up uh, photo, you can see the, the tissue now that's dried onto the glass slide. This tissue then will be batched up into slide holders and put into an automated H&E stainer. And H&E stands for hematoxylin and eosin. The hematoxylin is the purple stuff that stains the nucleus, and the eosin is the uh, orange-pink stuff that stains everything else. So we call that H&E. This is a H&E stainer, so each of these little boats will be an area that uh, the tissue will drop into to, to stain. And that takes about, what, is about 45 minutes, guys? About 45 minutes for that staining process to happen. When that's done, they'll take those slides off. They'll cover slip them. I'm not going to show you how they do that. They cover slip them, and they'll put a, a sticker on them with the patient name and a session number all together, recheck their logs, then they will deliver it out to my desk. So this is my desk. And here's my scope. This is the machine that's going to put my kids through college. Um, and then here's a stack of a tray of, of slides. Each of these trays holds uh, 20 slides, and this is a pretty typical uh, stack for a day. Uh, we read out anywhere from, oh, well, nowadays, somewhere between 70 and 90 cases a day, separate accession cases. So 70 to 90 different patients come through our desk every day. So now it's about 8.30 a.m. So that's when they get the slides to us. So it's been exactly 24 hours now since your patient came in for the biopsy, and now the real work begins for me, where I sit down and look at your patient's biopsy, make some decisions about what's going on. Is it benign? Is it malignant? Do I need to do anything else special, like order special studies? If it's a cancer, do I need to do an estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor? And all those things we also do in our lab, but I'm not going to discuss that today because we just don't have the time for that. But that kind of takes you through the process of how the pathology works. So instead of thinking, well, it just goes to the lab, that's what happens. There's many, many steps, many, many people involved, and it, and it does take about a day from when we get it in the lab to just generate a slide. So it's not an instantaneous process or not a magic machine that we just kind of grind the tissue in and it spits out a little ticker tape on the other end and tells us what's, what's going on. This is, uh, anyone know what this is? Yeah, it looks like a surprised poodle, like the ears going back, like, ah, um, or it's a rabbit. Uh, it's, this, is a, this is a pap smear, and uh, I, I thought this was, it, it kind of looked like a rabbit. I think, I think maybe Robin brought this into me. So I, I call this looking down the rabbit hole of pathology. All right, a couple pearls now. Um, this is a pretty common situation, and I've, I've spoken a little bit about making sure we maintain specimen integrity by checking labels and things like that. Uh, not too infrequently, something like this happens. You know, um, 
someone gets a little mad because, well, you know, I sent you guys a copal biopsy, copo, um, coposcopy, you know, if someone have abnormal pap and they have to go in for a, a, a cervical biopsy to see if there's a lesion. I sent a, a copal biopsy to you and your tech called me and said, um, they're sending it back because there's no patient identifier on the cup. And I'm telling you that's from this patient. I don't care. Just, just do it. Um, and now I'm, I'm pissed because you're sending this thing back to me and that's fine. You can be angry about that, but you know who else was angry was this Linda McDougall. Um, I don't know if you guys remember her a few years back up in Minnesota, I think in Minneapolis area. She had both her breasts removed um, because she was told she had cancer, uh, but yeah, well, maybe not because maybe there's a specimen mix-up in the pathology lab. People weren't paying attention to paperwork and slide labels, and she had both her breasts taken off um, for no, no good reason. Uh, so so she, was, she was angry, too. And I think, um, you know, when it comes to making sure care is safe for our patients, specimen labeling is, is one of those things that's just a no-brainer. And so we'll occasionally we'll call your office or we will send something back to have it labeled or, or designated um, by someone that this is this patient's tissue and where is it from. But it's important because we don't want stuff like this to happen. Now, in this, her case, it was a pathologist that screwed up. The pathologist had a, the wrong set of slides matched with the wrong set of paperwork and didn't do that last double check. But it certainly happens before we get tissue two, where we see, see things that are mislabeled or not labeled appropriately. So um, that's kind of one initiative for us here at, in Ames. We're going to try to improve patient safety by really adhering to good guidelines about specimen labeling and how we receive uh, tissues. And it, again, just it, it's important for us because at the end of the day, you know, we're generating over 40,000 slides a year in, in that laboratory. And uh, as you've seen, it's a complex multi-step process. And if we don't have things labeled up front, things just kind of barrel roll from there. So we really need good uh, identifiers, and it's, it's, it's just really important. It's part of the triple aim um, of good patient care and that we, we should not be harming patients. Patient safety should be uh, really a cornerstone of, of, of good care. My other pearl, this is more of a soapbox, I guess, and I won't say that this, is, should, this shouldn't be taken as medical legal advice in any sense. This is my opinion. Um, garbage tissue. People, you know, they come in, oh, I got a nodule on my back, and oh, it looks like that's lipoma. I'll just take that out here in the office, and I'm going to throw away that tissue in the garbage. I guess that's fine, but I, I think um, if you're going to incise someone, I, my rule of thumb is if you have to use a, a blade to make an incision through the skin to get at something, you should probably send that something to pathology. Uh, it helps you in that um, there's a definitive record of what you've taken out that way because we, we do a gross exam on it. We'll put a slide through. We keep those slides at a minimum 10 years, and right now we're keeping slides pretty much indefinitely. Um, and three, is, it's just it's good patient care because you might think it's a lipoma, but maybe it's, maybe it's not. And, and things that we found in tissue that sometimes gets thrown in the garbage um, are all these bad omas. We found melanomas, lymphomas, sarcomas, all the three pathology, me and Trish and Chris have all seen this stuff um, happen in things that are submitted as cysts or, or lipoma or skin tags. So, you know, just, just think about that a little bit. And if, if it's your practice to throw things in the garbage, I would really urge you to, to reconsider that. And if you still want to do it, I, I think you really need to educate the patient and let them know that you're doing that. Because we also occasionally get calls from patients. You know, I had a, I had a biopsy done by Dr. So-and-so, and I'm looking for my pathology here in my chart, and I don't see it. Or I, I requested my pathology report from ROI, and they, they don't have it. Well, it's because Dr. So-and-so didn't even send any tissue. Um, so it, it's, it's one of those things that you need to educate your patients if you're not going to send office tissue um, to pathology. But I, I would recommend it. All right, so that's kind of the, the pathology process of getting an H&E stain slide and a couple of pearls about labeling and specimen submission. I'm going to transition talking about uh, fine needle aspiration. Fine needle aspiration is a technique that's really nice because we can identify malignant versus benign conditions in uh, tumor masses, either superficial or deep, by passing a thin needle through that mass and getting just a little couple drops of what looks like bloody tissue. Um, and we can examine that under a microscope and a lot of times make a, a good diagnosis. Uh, FNA as a uh, Pathologist practice uh, entity didn't really come into uh, play until the late 1980s. Uh, uh, Scandinavian uh, doctors uh, and pathologists used uh, 
uh, pathology performed FNAs to, to diagnose things in the late 80s, and that kind of made its way over uh, to this country. And not everybody does FNAs, pathologists and surgeons and, and uh, office physicians, endocrinologists, uh, interventionalists. So Dr. Wanzik uh, does FNAs through his uh, bronchoscope in the bronch lab. Radiologists will do FNAs under CT or ultrasound guidance. So it's all over the place. But one thing people don't know maybe is that uh, pathologists actually offer the service um, here at Mary Greeley. And what we offer is that if you have a patient, either an inpatient or if you're on the main campus here in clinic that has a, you know, a, a mass that's new or suspicious or won't go away and you want to get it sampled, uh, we, we, can, we can do that. We can come up to your office and, and, and do that, usually that same day. Uh, we do that a lot for oncology. Uh, Larry, I think you, you, your, your group uses this quite often for FNAs. Uh, if it's a hospitalized patient, we can come up to the patient room and do it. Uh, the nice thing about us doing that is that we can bring our microscope with us and our slides and our stains, and we can do the FNA, we can make the smears, and we can immediately tell you what the prelim is. And furthermore, if we see something that we know we're going to need more tissue to do something with, if it's lymphoma and we want to get something for flow cytometry or for immunohistochemistry or other send-out tests, we can go right back and get more tissue um, right there on the spot. So it's something we do offer. Uh, if you're outside of Ames, uh, we, we can work with you if, if you want to have us do the FNA. Uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, Leslie Christensen, our uh, Mohs surgeon extraordinaire, had a patient with a neck mass and she wanted an FNA. Uh, I didn't really have the ability to go to West Ames because I was here at the hospital on call. So we were able to uh, finagle it that our friends in cardiology let us have a room and the patient came over to the Bliss or to the um, North Edition over here to cardiology, and I went and saw her up in cardiology, did an FNA, and she let her, let her go, and she went back home, which, you know, she lived maybe an hour, hour and a half away. So it was kind of nice to be able to get all that done the same day. So we can kind of work with you if, if you're not in the Ames main campus here. And uh, this is from Tom Johnson. He saw me wheel my cart down to the Bronx Lab one day. He goes, oh, it's like, it's like gun smoke. How microscope will travel. I, I kind of like that. We, we'll take our scope anywhere for the most part. Um, but I'm not going to talk about the technique of FNA so much. Is most I'm going to talk about more uh, the backside of it, actually making the smear. When we get an FNA sample, the most important thing you can do with that sample is to immediately make a high quality smear. Um, one thing that always pains me is when I get FNAs performed uh, by other providers, and I look at the slides, I'm like, wow, they got tons of great tissue. They did a great biopsy, but they made god awful smears, and this is uninterpretable. Okay. So the key to a good, a successful FNA procedure is to make a good smear. Other things that get smeared, uh, also that uh, you want to make good smears, you know, zinc preps. So that's, we actually see quite a few of those here. Um, a lot of providers do zinc preps. And again, a, a good thin smear is, is key. We get a lot of nipple discharges. Um, I'm going to tell you right now, that's almost a worthless test. So if you want to cut, cut a little cost out, if you have some of the nipple discharge, it just, we'll read them, but boy, I just, they're, they're hardly ever yield anything. They're, they're very non-fruitful. Uh, so nipple discharges, I, I wouldn't even recommend doing those anymore. The, there's a recent article in our literature looking at, uh, you know, six or seven hundred nipple discharges and the diagnostic utility was almost zero. Just, you know, we, well, we might say atypical cells, but there's always going to be cells that look kind of funny in nipple discharge because it's usually a duct that's damaged and you shed off weird looking cells. So bottom line is I wouldn't do that, but these are other things that might get put on a put on a smear. The, a good smear should look something like this. Uh, it should be thin and bullet shaped. You see these little light spaces? That's actually the glass slide underneath. You, you don't want it coating the whole thing. If you have little gaps, that's actually good because it means you're smearing everything out really thinly. It should be bullet shaped. It shouldn't be all, you know, concentrate at one edge up here or one edge down here, kind of get in the middle of the, of the slide. And we're going to see if we can uh, demonstrate this. So this is the second part of my experiment. So, all right, so I have a patient here. Um, his uh, first name is Barry and his last name is Straw. So I have a strawberry in a plastic, uh, plastic sack. Hello, Strawberry, or Mr. Barry. Oops, something happened there. And what we're going to do is I'm going to aspirate this, uh, this Mr. Strawberry and I'm going to smear some slides. I'm going to show you how to make a, a good smear. So and I've never done this before in a strawberry. Um, I'm, you know, so I don't know if this is going to work. This will be interesting to see what happens. Please note that all these slides are labeled. 
with the name. And if I knew the site, if this guy had like an arm or a leg, I'd put arm or leg or proximal thigh, something like that. So please label your slides if you, if you do office procedures that you're putting aspirates onto uh, yourself. Uh, it's frustrating to get a slide that's not labeled because it's hard to do anything with that slide. And it increases our liability of getting uh, the wrong patient assigned to the wrong pathology. All right, so I'm gonna take my, I'm gonna take my needle here and I'm gonna pass this into through the skin into the strawberry and see what happens. We'll do a little aspiration here and see if we get anything. I'm not using any anesthesia here, Mr. Strawberry Stuff. <laughs> All right, we'll see if we got anything out. So the key thing is you take the you take the, the needle hub off and you pull back on the on the syringe so you get a good a good amount of air in there. And then what you want to do is when you expel stuff, you want to try to shoot about two thirds or three quarters away up the slide like that. Okay. All right. And then what you want to do, you want to take a second slide, and you're going. To, this is going to be kind of a tandem thing here. Okay. So here's the slide that I put Mr. Strawberry's aspirate on, and you're going to make a little table for the slides. So you're going to put your four fingers from your non-dominant hand that has my left hand here underneath the slide to hold it. And your pointer and your thumb are going to hold the labeled end of the slide. So you have like a little table. It's very stable that way. Then you're going to take a second slide as your smearing slide. And what you're going to do, you're going to lay the second slide crossways and go down onto the aspirate material and pull all the way down to the end to hopefully make a bullet-shaped smear. So let's see if this works. Just like that. So I'll kind of, if I can hold it at an angle, you can kind of see the glint coming off it. There's that kind of bullet-shaped, glistening stuff. That's Mr. Strawberry smeared on the glass slide, nice and thin. The other way you can do this is with two slides. This is the, the, the method I call the Pifu Lu method. Pifu Lu was a cytopathologist. Well, he is still a cytopathologist. I don't think he's dead. Um, he's a cytopathologist that I worked at university for a while and trained uh, me and uh, Chris. And Pifu, what he did, instead of doing this thing where you make a little table and you do this stuff, he just would take two slides, cross them together like this towards the, the frosted end when you, with your aspirated material, and just, boom, like that. Just pull them together apart. And then you have, and then you have two, two smears. You can't see it very well here because it's not very... I was hoping Mr. Berry would be more red, but it's not. But anyway, that's, a, that's the way you do it. Um, again, if you, have, if you have questions about how to do it or you don't know how to make a good smear, call us because sometimes we can come up and help you. Um, and we do that for the radiologists and we do that for uh, Wanzek and the Bronk Lab. Uh, we'll actually take our scope and as they're getting aspirate stuff out, we'll put it right in the slide. We'll smear it, stain it, and give them, a, give them feedback immediately about what they're getting. Do they need to get more? Um, but that's how you make a good smear. The other um, little pearl here is if you do these aspirates in the office, Sometimes what happens is you'll get stuff stuck up, up in, the, in the needle hub, and you, no matter how much you push, you just can't get anything out. So what you want to do there is take a pair of pickups or a hemostat and grab the end of the needle and then place the hub over a glass slide that's labeled again and do this. Kind of flick that hub onto the slide and you'll expel stuff that was caught in that hub. And I can tell you that um, from experience, that stuff that gets caught in the hub is sometimes the diagnostic material. You make all these slides, you get nothing, and you empty that hub out, and these little splatter marks, those little splatter marks sometimes will have the diagnostic material. And you take that and make your smear. The other question that comes up often is, well, okay, I made smears, what do I do? Do I put them in formalin? Do I put them in a box? What do I do with them? If you don't want to do with them, the, the default is just let them air dry. We can, we, we can stay in air dry slides, and that's mostly what I do when I go on FNAs. I just do all air dry. If you happen to have a, a, a lab tech with you um, and they have an ethanol jar, you can do half your smears into ethanol and half them air dried. But if you're going to put a smeared slide in ethanol, it's got to be immediate. You can't you know, walk around and talk to Hallberg about something and, hey, how's it going, you know, then let it kind of partially air dry and then put it into ethanol or any type of fixative because it looks awful under a microscope that way. So if you're going to put it into a fixative, you got to do it immediately. Otherwise, just let it air dry. All right, so that, that worked out okay. I was hoping it would be a little more red, but it, that's, that's all right.
learn for next time. All right, so that's F and A. That's all I want to talk about with F and A. In the last few minutes, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about um, Lynch syndrome. What's the diagnosis here? Bad? <laughs> yeah, bad. It's usually pathology. If, that's the thing. If a pathologist shows something, right, it's usually bad. That's, that's kind of the, 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 just the reality of what we do. We, our interesting things are usually very bad for someone else. This is a colon cancer. Um, at the edges of the uh, photo here, you can kind of see this wrinkled uh, tan stuff. That's the normal colon mucosa. We've opened up the colon, and there's this big exophytic cancer here. Um, and pathologists are, you know, renowned for always comparing things to food. To me, this looks like an apple fritter, like we have in the doctor's lounge. You know, so. And, and I absolutely love apple fritters. And this will not dissuade me from grabbing a piece of apple fritter tomorrow when I come into the doctor's lounge to get the OR schedule. I, I, it's going to be there. I know I'm going to have a piece of it. Uh, but, I, you know, we, we compare things to food a lot. But it actually works because we were trying to think of something, how to describe something that everybody can understand. I could say, well, this is an exophytic, bosselated, tan, erythematous mass protruding from the lumen of the colon. Or I could say, it looks like a big apple fritter. I don't know what the better term would be, but... Uh, both are, both are apt, I guess. So we're going to talk a little bit about colon cancer and Lynch syndrome specifically. Um, colon cancer in the United States, which includes colon, sigmoid colon, and rectum, there are about 140, 150,000 cases. kind of depends how you define it. Uh, new cases of colon cancer each year. A very tiny sliver, but not insignificant sliver, of those cancers um, are actually associated with uh, Lynch syndrome, which is an autosomal dominant uh, heritable germline mutation in proteins that fix DNA, okay? So of every 100 colon cancers, you should expect to see three to five of them in the setting of Lynch syndrome. I'm not sure if our uh, numbers are quite actually that high here in central Iowa. I, sh I assume there are, there are some regional biases, but overall, three to five percent. And Lynch syndrome is important to identify uh, for a couple different reasons. One reason is that if you have a younger patient with an early cancer, they're probably going to have siblings who are young, their parents might still be young, and they might have children that uh, would all need to be properly counseled in the future about their relative risk of cancer. So it's a good way to get people into screening programs, you know, colonoscopies, um, things like that. So it's important for the, the patient's family members to know if, if their loved one has a cancer due to Lynch syndrome. And the other thing that's evolving out of this Lynch syndrome uh, research is that some colon cancer treatment decisions now are, are based upon whether it's a Lynch syndrome associate, or at least a, if it has the signature of a Lynch syndrome or not. So if, it's, if it has this abnormal DNA repair machinery, the oncologist will look at that and say, okay, we're, we're definitely going to treat with this chemo, or no, we're, we're not going to treat. Is that kind of correct, Larry? For stage 2 colon cancers, that, that can be helpful. So there's some predictive and prognostic information, too. So it, it's important to identify these. Um, and again, the, the proteins that are involved are called mismatch repair proteins, MMR for short. And it's inherited defects in these proteins. And what do these proteins do? They basically form a complex, and they fix little errors, basically, um, in the DNA. So here's the double-strand DNA helix. And there's all these proteins that have these funny little acronym-type uh, listings, and you don't need to really know what these are, but just know that there's a complex of these proteins that help kind of police the DNA and fix problems. And uh, when you have an abnormality of those, either because they're not expressed, or they're functionally abnormal, or the promoter of one of these proteins that leads to its expression is methylated, if you don't have these proteins, you don't have good DNA repair, and that can increase your risk of getting cancer. And that's why Lynch syndrome folks get lots of cancers and lots of polyps. So it's really an absence of these functional proteins that makes, a, makes it easier for the cancers to, to arise. The evolving kind of consensus is that, well, set back a few years ago, the idea was, well, only really look for these Lynch syndrome abnormalities in someone uh, maybe under 50 with a colon cancer. And then it was, well, maybe, maybe anyone under 60 with family history. Now it's getting to the point where most groups are saying you should definitely look for these, anyone under 60. Probably all new colon cancers, though, regardless of age, should be tested for these abnormalities. 
And we're kind of going that way now with new endometrial cancers. There's some guidelines that say anyone under age of 62 who's got a newly diagnosed endometrial cancer should have their tissue tested for these abnormalities to pick up Lynch syndrome probands. So we've kind of evolved from saying we should only do these in a very select few people. It's kind of grown to say, you know, we should probably just do, do more testing so we can identify these patients, get their families into the appropriate preventative um, care mechanisms uh, so we don't miss uh, early cancers that are preventable. Uh, the nice thing is, is that here at uh, McFarland Clinic and Mary Greeley, uh, we can do this testing here. Uh, there's multiple ways to do this testing to probe the system. We can do the initial screening here, which is very nice. We can generate a result sometimes the same day that we read out the biopsy. Usually it's at least by the next day, so we can get that information to, to your patient and to you very, very quickly. So the pearl here is that just to know that all newly diagnosed colon cancers and mitral cancers at Murray Greeley and, and within the McFarland Clinic system are going to get this uh, mismatch repair protein testing on their tumor tissues. And it's just that we just do it automatically. That's what we do. We, we feel that's the important thing to do and, and, and we do it. Now if, if this uh, initial testing is abnormal, meaning that we don't see the protein expressed, then there'll be some other testing that we'll suggest and those are send out tests that kind of, they're more expensive. They drill down to the more specific uh, root of, of the problem to see if it's really a Lynch syndrome patient or, or not. But as the screening tool, we can we can do that here. And this is my these are my only two photomicrographs through the microscope of educational value. I'm showing the whole presentation, so that's going to be a record for pathologists to go through. 45 minutes show only two educational photomicrographs. So here's uh, on the left. This is just a photomicrograph taken through the microscope of a colon cancer. Uh, you, the cells are kind of lined up here on the outside. Uh, there's a mixture of blue and pink here, and they're forming these little glands but they're not doing a great job of it. That's a, that's a cancer. That's what an adenocarcinoma looks like. Uh, we tested this one. This was a colon cancer. We tested this one for those four mismatch repair proteins that you saw complexed on that piece of DNA earlier in that earlier photo. We tested them in our lab using a technique called immunohistochemistry where we're taking antibodies that can recognize these specific proteins, putting those antibodies onto the tissue directly, and then using a secondary antibody to visualize any antibodies that stick. So it's a way just to see what proteins are there. And this patient had normal, normal intact DNA repair machinery. The brown signal here, that's, that means that that protein, in this case MSH2, was expressed in this tumor. And it's a nuclear stain, so they make little round dots here. So that's a normal. So that patient doesn't have Lynch, and we don't have to worry about that. If we didn't see any staining, that would be abnormal. The absence of that staining would say, okay, this could be a Lynch syndrome patient. We need to do the confirmatory uh, remaining testing tree to see if that patient is really a Lynch syndrome person or not. So, but this is an example of a normal result. And on the reports, you'll see us, sometimes we'll just issue it as an addendum to our uh, pathology reports. So we'll call it cancer, get that out to you so you know the patient has cancer, and then we'll add these, the results of these tests later on when we get the results back from our immunohistochemistry analyzer, either later that day or, or, or the next day. So. Right, and this is my fourth photomicrograph here, which is not educational. Um, what is this? What's the diagnosis here? That yeah, looks like Snoopy, right? Yeah, this is a thyroid aspirate, believe it or not. So the Snoopy is made up of little tangles and clusters of cells uh, from a, a thyroid nodule, and it just—it's weird what you see under a scope sometimes. It's kind of like looking at clouds. Yeah, oh, there's a lion or a bear or something. We see weird stuff underneath the microscope, and, and I saw this one uh, several years ago. I took a picture of it because it looked just like just look at, like a dog. So I also call this one as, you know, pathology is, is it's clear cut and as plain as the nose on a dog's face usually, you know. And uh, I wish it was always that case. But anyway, to, to summarize, uh, really what I want, my message I want to get across to you today was that when you have a patient who's biopsied or if you have a biopsy yourself, know that there's a whole team of professionals that is taking care of that tissue and it's a very complex multi-step process that even though we have some automation to it now really hasn't changed a whole lot since that doctor who was smoking the camels back in 1948. It's really the core of it. It's the same. Generating any slide, that's our workhorse. Getting those slides out, that's the, that's the meat and potatoes of pathology. Um, FNA is a good technique to use if you have someone with a superficial mass 
It's simple, safe, and fast, and pathologists can be consulted to perform that procedure, and we can interpret that immediately and, and uh, repeat the procedure if we need to to get more uh, material. And the third thing is to know that if you have a patient that you're taking care of in the McFarland Clinic system or at Mary Greeley who has a new endometrial cancer or a new colon cancer, they will automatically be screened for the molecular mechanisms that lead to Lynch syndrome. So we're, we're picking up those patients here. And it's 12.55 and we're on time and I'll take any questions if you have any. Do, <clears throat> do, do you do uh, the MMR, the Lynch testing on benign adenomatous polyps? Yeah, the question is do we do the mismatch repair protein testing on uh, tubular adenomas, which are the uh, thought to be the precursor of, of colon cancers? And no, we do not. Um, that is not recommended testing because you can get uh, false positives with that. So we don't do it on adenomas. It doesn't, doesn't really help you stratify very much. Yep. Jamie, um, how do we get a frozen sample from interventional radiology um, procedures? I just want to make sure we, we know the process for that. Oh, that's a good question. So the question is, um, I have a patient and they have a deep-seated mass or tumor or something anatomically wrong that I want radiology to biopsy, and I want to know an answer today, so I want to get a frozen section from the pathologist. Uh, tell the radiologist that you want a frozen section. We, we do that all the time. Uh, they'll, they'll bring down the cores. Uh, just a couple days ago, I was on call, and uh, Dave Larson brought tissue down for me to, to freeze, and, and they'll stay right there until we tell them if they, if they have the tissue that they need or not. Um, so just tell radiology. Let us know, too, so we know what to look for. But just tell radiology that you want a, a frozen section, and, and that'll get done. This, this reminded me of a question in, in uh, temporal artery biopsy. Some people do frozen section to get a, an earlier uh, answer. Is that, is that reasonable? It, yeah, the, the question is, uh, you know, temporal artery biopsy is looking for giant cell arteritis and someone, you know, with, you know, eye, eye findings or headaches. Should you do a frozen section? You can. I mean, if, if it's something where you want to start or stop, you know, prednisone and, and let's say you have a pretty low risk of suspicion, uh, frozen is probably okay. If you have a higher risk of suspicion, though, I would, I would rather we routinely process that so we get good, nice serial sections through the artery so we can even pick up the, even the smallest area of inflammation. So I would say if you're very, if you're, you'll think, now that I don't think this is, but I just want to make sure I'm going to get a biopsy. Frozen is okay if you want to make a decision right then and there about stopping or starting prednisone. Otherwise, it's better to have it formal and fixed and routinely processed and, and wait if you can because we do get a better look at tissue um, in our regular routine processing, which I showed you earlier, rather than a frozen section because there are some artifacts that we, uh, that we work through on frozen that could... So some people did frozen section on the first artery. If it is negative, they do the second on the spot. I mean, mm. that's, that's one approach. Yeah, it's kind of the old axiom, the, the more you look, the more you find type of deal. So uh, I think at this institution, we typically just do one artery. And uh, I have done a frozen occasionally on an artery. Sometimes what I'll do, I'll freeze half the artery. And I tell the surgeon, I'm freezing half if you want a frozen. But I'm going to save the other half for permanent section so I get good looks at it. Because as you know, the, the inflammation can be very spotty in those arteries. So, All right. Thank you very much.